<laughs> okay. So we're glad to have Colin here. Thank you everybody for coming. Michaela is going to ask Colin some questions. And then at the end, feel free to chime in and ask any questions that you could have. Thank you, Ken. So today we have Colin Anawadi with us. He is a product architect and entrepreneur responsible for the design and experience of many platforms revolving around safety and health. He is responsible for patient IO, which has changed the way health professionals deliver treatment specific tasks, reminders and educational content directly to patients, family and or caregivers. Colin has also created Plurts.com, a global emergency service underwritten by the Lloyds of London. Plurts was acquired by Rev Worldwide in 2010, where Colin spent two years as director of mobile financial products across the US, Europe, Australia, and Latin America. Before that, Colin designed top mobile entertainment apps and spent two years in Los Angeles prototyping a multiplayer game platform licensed by ID Software and Riot Games. So Colin, tell us about where you grew up and about your family. Was your family entrepreneurial? Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks everyone for coming out uh, despite the weather. Hopefully I can be entertaining and I am an open book. So if you have any questions at the end, uh, please go ahead and ask. Uh, I, did, I grew up in Houston, Texas in a s suburban community um, just outside, you know, a small town. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, became an accountant later after we grew up, and my dad is, uh, still is a, a real estate entrepreneur. So how long have you been in Austin? Uh, I came here in 2000, and I went to UT, um, and then in 06, I graduated and spent two years in Los Angeles, but then quickly returned um, in 08, around the time that Apple had launched the iPhone and the App Store. So what was your first professional project and what was that experience like for you as a new professional? Yeah, so I got started um, when I was about 14 or 15 um, developing websites. So my first professional project uh, paid for my first car, which was to develop a website for a real estate agency, or a real estate firm. And at the time you couldn't get top level domain names for $4.99 on GoDaddy. And so actually the common thing back then was like, tripod.com slash and then the company name or GeoCities or I don't I'm, I'm seeing some blank looks I don't am I dating myself like this is the day of like a lot of free free hosting services and stuff because um, getting a, a domain name and all that other rigmarole for for a real estate firm was was pretty kind of out there and it's very expensive um, so that's kind of where I got started and uh, on the professional side did you look up to anyone um, a mentor possibly or um just someone that you saw online and why uh, did you yeah I mean I guess not to be cliche but um, as a designer and product guy I think you know we tend to resonate with Steve Jobs and his drive for perfection um, sadly the day before my 30th birthday is when he passed away so like I sat on my couch and had this deep moment of like reflection on like what am I doing with my life like this guy accomplished so much and I'm nothing compared to him uh, but in a more kind of like realistic, more grounded sense. Um, one of my first investors is a guy named Andrew Busey, who kind of picked me up when I had moved back from Los Angeles, a video game startup uh, I was a creative director at didn't work out, and he was doing a startup called Challenge Games that was bought by Zynga Austin, turned into Zynga Austin, and he kind of took me under my wing, or under his wing, and has mentored me since. So what propels you into the safety and health sector? Is there anything that happened? Yeah, I think, um, you know, observationally, the Bay Area has a lot of uh, young guys building problems for themselves, like disappearing photos and photo sharing apps. And this is, this is obvious, right? Like you're young and that's what you want to do. Um, but the healthcare industry has been neglected from uh, things that can better patients' lives. Um, and a lot of that is because as young people, we don't have, we don't suffer these serious chronic diseases. We're not in the hospital, we're not going to an infusion clinic. So we don't know that problem. Sadly though, we are the people that are most, generally most competent and most familiar with building up a great consumer experience. So um, that's been my big motivator for doing healthcare. Uh, it's, it's just been very neglected. And I felt like um, more people like us need to, to put the time in, into doing it. So how do you work around the safety and um, just potential for confidentiality breaches um, with this sort of industry? Um, so everyone, if you've worked in healthcare, there's a thing called HIPAA, 
It's a very complicated law, but it's pretty easy now these days with things like, uh, there's a SAS solution we use for doing um, all the policies and procedures that we need to follow for doing employee quizzes. We do background checks. Um, and then that's kind of the people processes side of the equation. Then you have the technical side, which isn't that complicated if you have an engineer that knows what he's doing. So you have an, an encryption um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And fortunately now, this has changed in the last two years with the Azure, uh, Amazon Web Services, and even Google now sign what's called a BAA, uh, which means that they follow all the procedures to be HIPAA compliant. So it's gotten a lot easier. Um, but it's still, you know, there's still stuff that you have to deal with. And fortunately, once you get through it, once you understand it, it's your, it's, it's your own barrier for other people to get overwhelmed by that stuff and you don't want to deal with it. When did you launch this? Um, my business partner and I started this about two years ago in my extra bedroom condo. We had started as a general health and wellness app uh, and had launched a product uh, with Aetna when they were doing a, a what was called a PHR, a personal health record kind of like Microsoft Health Vault, and uh, that didn't work out. Um, but what rose from the ashes was Patient.io. How do you put a value on your company when you're trying to pitch this to doctors or patients who would use this? Um, you been selling to? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the, the biggest challenge for anyone who wants to go into healthcare is figuring out the business model. Um, the thing that we struggled with the most is who pays for it. So typically when you sell enterprise software, it's pretty transactional. You're selling to the person who's gonna write the check. In healthcare, that's a lot different. So you can go to a doctor and the doctor's gonna be like, how am I gonna get reimbursed from this? Well, where does that reimbursement come from? Well, depending on the patient, it could come from Medicare, Medicaid. It could come from a variety of payers. And so that's where things get really complicated. And um, figuring out the business model is something that we're still trying to fine tune today. Was there anything like this when you first developed this or a business model that you patterned? Um, patient engagement and as a kind of a broad term in healthcare has been done a lot. There's things like patient portals, there's wellness like incentive stuff around health, health and wellness. Um, what we really focused on is a kind of a platform for helping patients follow doctor's orders but really focused on chronic diseases. So things where people are very motivated to manage this disease or it's gonna overtake their life. And I'm not talking about diabetes, even though diabetes is a big problem, like it's still something that is more often than not self-inflicted or if you have type one, like you're gonna still go to, most people are gonna to go to McDonald's and get a supersized meal. Like you're not motivated until it crosses into the area where it's going to seriously jeopardize your life, you're not going to make your daughter's wedding, you may lose a limb, you may fall into a diabetic coma. Like, and so we take our software and focus on um, kind of the, the people who are motivated, not just a general health and wellness app for, for anybody. Can you elaborate on the demographic that's using this right now? Um, and how do you combat tech illiterate um, patients or consumers using this? Yeah, um, so surprisingly, uh, so we, we service patients that are dealing with things like MS, Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, pariasis, and um, my mom included, like, you'd be surprised now the adoption of smartphones. Um, even in underserved communities, the Android device has become kind of the replacement for the $100 laptop initiative. This is becoming the computer because it's connected, it's one bill, it's pretty cheap. Um, with the exception of like, People who are 75 and above, penetration's pretty down, you know, pretty far, pretty far in there. But we do support accessibility and access via email and desktop computers. Um, but it's it's only going to keep growing. Like the feature phones, pretty much dead, as far as I'm concerned. Can you break down the development um, for iOS and Android, and is one easier than the other, or if you only had the time, the money, and the energy, which one would you invest in or start out with? Uh, yeah, sure. So, broadly speaking, iOS is certainly the easiest. It's the easiest to monetize. Um, you know, thousands, millions of people have credit cards already on file with iTunes. That's not the case with Google Play yet. Uh, but you also have an exploding Android market because it is so cheap. 
Um, I think generally you probably want to build for iOS first, master it, you know, get adoption, prove it out, and then grow into Android. But I've also seen cases where people have started on Android and then grew into iOS because it is such a, it's, you know, it's, it has different benefits to it, right? You don't have the approval process. There's more flexibility in what you're kind of trying to do with the app, whereas iOS is a little bit more sandboxed. But generally speaking, especially for selling games, like iOS is the place to be. For those wanting to create an app, can you break down the prototype development process <clears throat> and at what point do you um, transition from finding staff for the development side into the business side? Okay, so that's two questions, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. answer the first one. Yeah. Uh, I'm classically trained as an engineer and designer, so for me personally, I tend to go straight into high fidelity mockups and clickable prototypes. That's not necessarily the right way, it's just the fastest way. And in startups, you are constrained by time and capital. So if I don't have to start with a wireframe and then pass it off to a designer and then pass it off to an engineer, and I just go straight into developing and iterating from there, like that's all usable code that my engineer team can go in and start making functional immediately. That's not to say that that's the correct way, um, but it's the fastest way for me. Um, other, other companies use a traditional UX guy and then they bring it into a designer and then they go to the engineer and you can build great products that way too, um, you know, to each their own. Uh, as far as, what was the second question? Um, hiring, hiring only development staff and then going to the business. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I think that also depends on the two kind of, you kind of have two very obvious business models, either you're doing enterprise or you're doing consumer. And consumer, you don't really have very often the benefit of going out and selling something first. You kind of got to build it and see if people love it. On the enterprise side, and we did this for Patient.io, we sold a slide deck to our customer. We didn't actually have a functioning product, who then became our investor. By the time we got through legal, uh, the business agreement and purchasing, we had already built, we had used that money to kind of build the, the platform. So on the enterprise side, I think you can sell first. Uh, but that doesn't mean you need to go and get a whole sales team because despite selling one customer, that may be an anomaly and you got to figure out what's reproducible in your whole model, top to bottom. You need training documents, you need support before you start staffing up on the sales side. That kind of leads to my next question. Um, so recently patient IO moved from mobile to desktop. Mm -hmm. um, what is that process like? <clears throat> So we have built a, a true platform. So uh, for, for the technical people in here, we have, we're API first, meaning um, we don't really care what's connecting with us. All of the business logic is contained in the servers. Even the apps that we build, uh, there's a lot of code to make the experience great, but there's not a lot of business logic there. They're waiting on the server to tell the app what to tell the patient. And so as far as moving from Android to iOS, to a desktop experience, to eventually even two-way SMS or interactive voice recordings, all of the hard stuff is already built. It's just trying to figure out what, what the new kind of cosmetic layer is gonna look and feel. So it's not actually that complicated um, from our perspective to, 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 to create new access points. So you've traveled around the world for your career and um, what are some of the challenges of transitioning onto different global platforms? So the last five years, I've worked in finance and healthcare, and that's arguably probably the hardest industries to ever take globally. Uh, one, you have, from a marketing perspective, you have to understand the kind of the cultural fabric, right? Like, there's a lot of people that distrust both healthcare and finance in the United States, in Mexico, in Brazil. Um, from a business and product standpoint, you have requirements at the, at the government level, at the legal level that you need to understand. And then, you know, more superficially at the product experience level, a design may look really pretty and really elegant in the US, but when you translate the button, you find out that done is actually a word this long and it breaks your entire design. So there's like a whole lot of different elements uh, from my, my experience, but again, healthcare and finance are entirely different beasts. In the U.S., we have the benefit of hundreds of banks. In some countries, there's one nationalized bank. And if you don't play nice with them, you're not going to that country. 
What is something you wish you had known before getting into these industries? Mm. They're hard, they're unfun. And <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, I, I couldn't say, I don't really have like one defining thing that I wish I had known. Um, but I think that's why I signed up for the battle. It's like, I'd rather do the hard stuff than, than the easy stuff. And that was one of the reasons I stopped doing video games. It's because it took the fun out of something I actually enjoyed doing, which was playing video games. And so I'd rather keep the fun stuff, the fun stuff. And if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna put myself through the grinder, I'd rather it be, it's gonna be hard anyway, and might as well do something that I think generally better society as a whole. Not that video games don't, but. Has there ever been a low point in your startup process? And if so, how did you recover? There's been so many low points. Like that's the game, you know? Like there's not, it's not always a high. Um, in this company, I think it was a, my business partner and I had a pretty big disagreement where we almost thought we were gonna shut the company down. Right before that, we had a, a pending lawsuit that we almost shut the company down for. Um, lately, everything's been great. Before that, it was an acquisition that didn't work out the way I'd hoped it, to, it would work out. Um, and that was a lesson in M&As and culture fits. Uh, prior to that, it was the video game startup in LA where we had signed two AAA publishers, one of which is now bigger than World of Warcraft. And uh, contracts were pulled. And, you know, like, I can just keep going on. Like, that's the startup life. What kind of lawsuits do you encounter with, with uh, patient IO? I'd rather not talk about it because the company's still here. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone have questions from the audience? I'm an open book. Far away. Can you talk more about your work at Filament Labs? Uh, like day to day stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I do, um, I'm the product guy. So I, I do a lot of the conceptual stuff from the patient experience down to um, the dashboard and um, work with our customers. As an early stage company, uh, I do a lot of this, the CFO level and CSO, COO type of work. So doing HR, I take out the trash, I clean desks, I you know, do a little bit of everything, um, but predominantly my focus is around product. Is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't asked yet? I'd like to know what people's interests are in either healthcare or startups in general. Um, and if you don't have any questions for me, I don't think I have any other questions. We need some audience interaction. Um, I have a question from a product development standpoint. What are some of the, what do you believe are some of the most valuable models or tools to use, especially in the patient engagement space, to really understand how you can build a product for that space? Um, so I'll run through some of the tools that we use, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done with the product, because patients, it's a very sensitive issue with data collection for patients for HIPAA reasons. So I, as I was telling another guy, I use Sketch 3 today. I don't use Photoshop as much for doing mockups. Uh, in our early days, we had created um, images and put them on the phone and just had patients kind of slide through and give us feedback. Now there's actually software that you kind of upload a JPEG and you can create hotspots. Achieves the same thing, but a little bit better. Um, we also now do some of our customers, um, independent of what we're doing with patient IO, they have patient advisory boards to come once a month and talk about their, their experience in the, in the clinic and with their nurses. And so they've allowed us to use that time to also get feedback about the app and figure out how we can make it better. And, and more importantly, it's also a really interesting time to understand what these patients are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, again, like these are, in, in many cases, this is stuff that we're not really living with. Some of these people have five serious chronic diseases. They're, you know, they're, their medicine cabinet's completely stuck. Like it's just a completely different life that um, I've been fortunate enough to have to deal with, but uh, you really understand the challenges that they're going through. We had a question in the back. Who's your competition and what is your marketing strategy? Who's our competition? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, 
pretty awesome startup. I think in the Boston area, it's called WellTracked. Uh, they just did their Series A for about eight million. Um, uh, Jonathan Bush, the CEO of Athena Health, is one of their advisors. Uh, really cool, really cool, very similar. Um, another one is in the San Francisco area. It's called Health Loop. And uh, the benefit, or what I like about what we've done, is in a year we figure this out, and most of these are about four years old. Uh, and so I, I do firmly believe that if there's no competitors, there's probably no market. It's rarely a, a true blue ocean or a greenfield opportunity. Um, so the time seems to be right for, I think all three of us will succeed. Like healthcare is just too big and there's too many kind of unique needs for one company to own it all. Uh, as far as marketing strategy goes, we're, we are also still figuring that out. We've, we've done PR, we've done um, conferences, we've, we've, you know, we've won accounts from all of them, but I think by and large, for healthcare, uh, referral seems to be the number one uh, uh, way for us to get big accounts. I guess along with that, a really quick follow-up with that, what is your number one target market then in terms of type of business to business customer? So we've been having a lot of success lately. Uh, we, we first thought, I think for any first time entrepreneur in healthcare, you think of healthcare as one big market. That's a huge mistake. Uh, and so we quickly realized we could not sell into the hospital systems without a lot of clinical data. And so what we did is we turned our focus to outpatient clinics. So you can think of these as like the, the, the offices trying to rob customers from the big monolithic hospital systems by offering a better patient experience. So kind of the consumerism of healthcare, like the Starbucks experience, it feels like your living room instead of a hospital. And so we were going to them and selling them on the purely like this, you, you just need to do this, right? Like this is a great patient experience. Nobody else is doing it. But then we quickly realized how hard it was to train them that we weren't quite ready to be a true SaaS platform, that we were more of an enterprise company. And now we're working with disease management companies who have a book of business of like a hundred thousand lives uh, or employees lives that they already have on file. Uh, and we're also starting to get a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies who have, um, you know, the, the Swine Affordable Care Act, they're still the ones making a lot of money and they have marketing budgets and they're not making decisions purely around clinical data. They're, they're making it around, here's a value add to couple with my medication to get my doctor to want to prescribe it. Just a quick question. We have already covered this, but so when you're selling to an outpatient clinic like that, um, as opposed to a larger hospital, how have you adjusted your revenue model? Because I know one of the things that you started off with was that you really learned that, you know, you have to find out who's really going to be floating the bill, right? You mm -hmm. can go to a doctor's office, but it's pre Medicare and Medicaid. Is it the same type of format going after these smaller fish? Um, not, so the thing about the big hospital systems is they tend to have to follow more of the rules and regulations of the Affordable Care Act. Outpatient, it's kind of like the same thing as like a private restaurant where they can choose to accept you or not. And a lot of those outpatient clinics sometimes are like private pay only or a lot more selective and a lot more focused. So you can sell to them directly. You just have the same scaling challenge regardless of who it is, which is going to thousands and thousands of clinics and training all the nursing staff. It's just not a very scalable model. It doesn't mean it, it can't work and it can't get you your first customers to start getting that clinical data to then go further upstream to the hospital systems. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so uh, fortunately I can't yet talk about a really big client that we just brought on, but I'll give you a similar use case in an outpatient clinic. So one of our first customers was in, in infusion therapy. And what infusion is, is a patient will come in usually on a monthly or bi-monthly basis and they'll sit in a chair and they'll get really expensive drugs, usually about 10,000 bucks an injection uh, into their arm. And they have to sit there for about three, three to six hours. And they have to do this pretty much for the life, for the rest of their life. 
like these are serious chronic diseases like MS or Crohn's that aren't really treatable. I mean, they're not curable, they're just treatable. And um, if they don't manage kind of the, the things that they need to do before that injection and after, then they get flu-like symptoms. And so not only are they taking time out of work to come there and get the injection, but if they don't, they don't drink enough water, they don't take their post meds, if they don't do a number of other things, then uh, sometimes they're bedridden for three days. So our software helps to remind them because it does become repetitive as their appointment gets closer to the things that they need to do to make sure that that health outcome for that month is, is better. The great thing about this demographic is that they are sitting in a chair for three to six hours and they really don't have anything better to do. So it's been a great opportunity for us to be able to get patients who are engaged and who are, who are also are buying smartphones because they sit in the chair for that long. So they're playing Angry Birds and now they're using our software to report side effects and stuff like that. And the big benefit from the nurse's side is previously these patients would get injections, go home and have all these side effects, and either they'd stop care or they'd be hospitalized because the nurses didn't they didn't know that they were going through some of this some of these issues. And then they would come back in 30 days later and report what had happened, but they would have forgotten by that time. And so now within a day, within two or three days, they're able to immediately report those side effects. The nurses in real time can see what's going on, get alerts, call them up, coach them through, uh, retain customers, and sometimes prevent hospitalizations. So, uh, have y'all been working with like different medical devices, wearables, APIs, or data? We only support HealthKit today, so we're, we're relying on the popularity of that to drive integration into all the hardware devices. I think there's probably going to be some consolidation and shake out, so we're not we're not trying to integrate with every single hardware device today. Uh, Self-reported is typically fine enough. In fact, in, you know, in underserved communities, those people don't even have connected hardware. Can you explain the how PatientIO first um, becomes available to the patient? Is there a sit-down moment between the doctor and the patient that, hey, there's just there's patient IO to help you keep up with your medications yeah. or so that's that's probably one of the them. hardest issues for us because a lot of these healthcare systems are not digital yet, especially in the outpatient market. So this is another challenge when you're selling to those guys. Hospital systems do have to do things like EHR and start to you know they're being forced by legislation, but the outpatient market doesn't. One of our customers schedules patients on a barbershop calendar, paper calendar. I've, I swear to God. So like integrating with their existing records was impossible. So they have to, we have to train the nurses to educate the patient on how to download and install and use this stuff. In other cases, in a disease management, fortunately, generally those people are managing populations of tens of thousands. And so we, we suck in what's called an eligibility file and then they blast out an email to their employees that say, hey, activate your account. And the employee types in the last four digits of their social and they create an account. But we've already set everything up on the back end. So it makes it really, really easy. And that's kind of the ideal integration for us. But we do support access code, enrollment, self-enrollment. Um, we're soon going to work on a kiosk so that outpatient clinics can have a, an iPad on the stand and the patient can just type in their email and get an invite to simplify it, because it is, it is a real challenge. So is there a monthly fee that patients pay or? No, almost, it's almost always free to the patient. So that's really important to us because a lot of these people are dealing with really expensive healthcare. How did you get to that point? Most healthcare kind of operates that way. Um, whether it's payers, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, it's, it's hard to charge the patient. Uh, for stuff like this, unless you're in the general health and wellness. And those are th things like Matt My Fitness or Nike Fuel Band. Like those people, those aren't, that's not our demographic. And they're, they're going to spend money on their health and, and fitness. I think that's all I have. Uh, I have uh, going back to uh, the No, you're making the right assumption. Uh, so how do you go about finding out what that experience is like to build that? Uh, for patients? Yeah. Um, we, so when we were 
building our first product, we had pitched around, we pitched at CTAN, um, and a guy who operated a bunch of infusion therapy clinics say, said, came to us and said, hey, I like what you're doing, but you should bring this into the chronic disease space. And so for a few months, we were, uh, my business partner, Jason, and I were like, do we really want to go that deep into healthcare? You know, we thought about it for a long time. And uh, we decided it was, it was the time to do it. And we were told, don't do it. There's a lot of dead carcasses, patient engagement, it's not going to work. And uh, we just decided to do it anyway. And we probably spent the last year becoming healthcare guys. Like it, it definitely didn't happen overnight. It's, it's kind of learning its own language. For sure. Yeah. So patient engagement is a big deal for um, you know for CPR as well and diseases or chronic diseases. Uh, have you all thought about like gamifying patient IO to make it more interactive for the like, younger generation of patients with chronic diseases as well? Yeah, we have. <laughs> um, I think it's on our roadmap. I'm, I'm very, you know, I come from video games, so I, I buy into gamification, but I also think it can be overused and become a novelty. And in our core demographic, these people are pretty motivated to adhere, and what they're really looking for is more feedback in terms of like a nurse calling them or nurse interventions or other stuff like that. And so where we've lost some people in the past is that they're recording all this data but they're not getting a phone call. And so what we're really focusing on now is how do we, how do we build out a, a deeper solution that really solves their problems? It's not that they're not motivated to do it, it's that they're not feeling like they're getting enough out of it. And I don't know that a gift card or points or anything like that's really gonna be what they're looking for. Uh, but it is, I do think there's some element there that, that we're gonna start to entertain as we work with some of the pharmaceutical companies. Is there any opportunity for family members to get alerts? Yeah, so um, about a month ago we released, so this came out of a patient advisory board. Uh, a, a older woman was dealing with three or four really, really serious diseases, taking a cocktail of drugs that would wipe her out for about five days. She, she was extremely intelligent. She's probably been one of our best beta testers. Like she would hook up her Android phone and send us crash logs but there was a period in time where when she was going through her intense drug therapy that she could not visually see, she would have the shakes. And so her husband would have to, you know, he was the one standing by her bed and seeing all the stuff that she was going through. And she would forget, she would kind of like black out and not know what all that, all that happened to her during that time. And so what we've, we, we've recently built is the ability to add friends and family so that they, they can act as a caregiver and record data on your behalf or if you were, you know, if you unfortunately had a, a daughter that had type two diabetes but was off in school, like as a father, you could be able to manage that remotely and at least see how her health is progressing. What about support groups or networks? Is there anything like that going on with patient IO? Not currently, but um, it is something that we've kind of kicked around. In fact, one of the best or one of the lo longest standing healthcare startups is a a website and community called Patients Like Me. And about five years ago when they demoed at Health 2.0, uh, I think they came and demoed again recently and they're the only startup that still survived healthcare. Do you have any more questions? How about just partnering with them? Uh, we have thought about that too, but we're still kind of trying to figure out our path. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, what are your plans for growth? To grow? No, uh, this is a good question. So, um, on the enterprise side, I think it's important to find you know three kind of three or four lighthouse customers. Generally, you know, pretty big enterprise accounts that have brand recognition, but also that internally have someone that understands what it means to work with a startup. It's too easy for a big company to come in, throw their weight around, and actually like crush you with all their demands and their requests. But also, like if you're going to put in all that energy, you want that growth to be there because you can keep selling within the same company. But once you, like in your early years, you got you got to really master the support that's required. So you're going to learn about that. You're going to learn about the training requirements. And once you've kind of mastered that and it's reproducible, then you start finding channel partners and resellers because the recipe is there. Anyone can go sell it. You've got the support to back it. 
And so that's kind of our, our growth strategy is um, once we've gotten through these next kind of hallmark customers to then start finding our, our uh, channel partners. Speaking of growth, would you add on to the current team you have? Uh, when the time's right, yeah. yeah. What is it like with just a two-person team trying to break into this huge... So we're not two people anymore. Um, we've got about 10 people. We have an open right for another engineer. Two full-time mobile developers in Minnesota, and then most of our team is here. And we have one senior level consultant who's been in the healthcare industry for 20 years, who uh, who's very expensive, so we can only afford her part-time, um, but she gives us a lot of guidance on the sales side. Are there any disadvantages to having some team members in a different location that are out of state? Or yeah, that's, like that? that's actually, it, it has raised some issues. Um, these guys are really, really talented. They came from Expedia, so they, they've done all of Expedia's mobile apps, um, hotels, etc. And so they're super talented, but it, it does create some cultural issues, and it would be ideal to have everyone in the same room. Um, I've done startups where we've almost, the whole team's almost all been remote, and I think, you know, there's ways you can save money, but at the end of the day, you're not saving that much money for what you're losing in team cohesion, culture, uh, other types of efficiency, like just being able to turn your chair around and, and talk to your business partner and stuff like that. So um, it works for us today, but I think we're gonna focus mostly on building the team here until we get to a point where we start having regional offices. Is there a specific software development methodology that you guys follow? I don't know if it's called Agile, Scrum, Waterfall, Kanban, whatever, but we use Trello and we have kind of our own workflow, um, very Agile-ish. And uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not a big, like, I'm not big on the various methodologies, but we definitely um, do sprint planning and stuff like that, have Monday stand-up meetings and whatnot. Sounds like you can start as a Our first, so we, when we launched our app, it was a consumer app, so we didn't, it didn't take much for us to throw it on, on iTunes. Our first um, partner was Aetna, and we got them by sneaking our way into a South by Southwest panel that their digital, their head of digital was speaking at. And we walked up to her, and we introduced ourselves, and over the next few months, kept sending her email and decks of what we were working on. And she picked us to be one of the apps that they showcased on their platform. Um, turns out, no big surprise, but consumers don't trust payers, so they were not gonna give them their data, and the marketing was went really sour. Um, fast forward a year, almost to this day, they have now shut down that initiative. So um, it was a lesson learned on not relying on payers for marketing, um, but they are good if you can get them to pay for reimbursements of your software for the doctors to use. Our, our first real paying customer came out of us pitching around Austin, and an angel investor who happened to run this uh, chain of clinics saw it and said, hey, you guys need to bring this to chronic diseases and we'll, we'll also CG finances for it. I think that's my big advice too, is like, um, it's one thing if you're a very accomplished entrepreneur and you're working on the next great idea and you want to be super stealthy about it, but if you're a first time entrepreneur, you should probably try to go and talk with as many people as possible. And I'm not a pitch man, my business partner is fortunately, but I, I definitely encourage you to get out there and just talk with a bunch of smart people. Because if you can't convince a bunch of smart people that you're working on something great, um, especially other entrepreneurs, Chances are you probably need to really think about what it is you're doing. We have time for one more question. At what point will you see the need to bring on a sales team? So we we have a sales um, uh, veteran that works with us part time. My business partner drives most of the sales. I think that will probably be the next hire once we have finished developing out our training and support stuff. So 
We're a little behind on that, um, but that's kind of the next quarter or two for us to develop. And then we'll probably start to look at uh, full-time sales stuff. All right, thank you so much, Colin, for being here with us yeah, tonight. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for showing up. Hope uh, it was informative. And we have uh, two giveaways today, or one giveaway. Um, oh, oops, sorry, I did it. <laughs> we have um, we have speakers. We're going to introduce um, one of our sponsors right now. Thank you to our sponsors, um, RC from Ram Law Firm, He's back there in the tan jacket. You don't want to hear from a lawyer, so it's okay. Uh, I've got throw shirts up there. So. Yeah, he's a great lawyer. He works with a lot of startups, and he's located in the downtown area. So thank you, RC. And then Ben from Loophole has a survey out there. Do you want to come up and say something about it? Well, just uh, real quick, Loophole is a local Austin uh, startup, and we've tackled the issue of, of less than 1% engagement on customer surveys. And so we offer a split second uh, survey for, for business owners to use while the impression is fresh in the customer's head. Um, we have an iPad out there, so on your way out, give it a tap or two. Uh, all your feedback is to be used to make this even better than it was. And uh, thanks, Kim, for having us. Sure. So thanks everybody for coming. If you parked in the garage downstairs, you can see Ashley in a green sweater back there, and she has uh, $5 parking vouchers. And our next event is on December 2nd, and we have um, Alan from Funware speaking. So please come back. <laughs>